ですけど All right, everyone, uh, we're going to give about a minute or so more before we get going. So we'll get more people online and and uh, we'll start the presentation then. So hold tight. All right, um, let's uh, get started. It's just a little after two. Uh, I'm uh, Mike Wendy with uh, WISP. I'm the Director of Communications here, and I want to welcome everyone to today's webinar on marketing and selling broadband, what you need to know to get more customers. So we have a great presentation uh, today over the next hour with two industry experts on the topic. Uh, we'll hear first from Doug Adams of the Think Agency, who is uh, based out of uh, Boulder, Colorado. And then uh, we'll hear from Evan Galvin, who is a WISP, also a WISP, and a WISPA member. Uh, he's with Ping Marketing, and he's based out of the Chicago area. Um, I just want to do a couple of housekeeping items before we get going. We're going to let Doug and Evan give their presentations first uh, and then uh, take questions after. And you can provide me with those questions uh, uh, via the question box at the bottom of the uh, webinar there. So I can read those and, and uh, time permitting, try to get to as many as possible. I'm just going to read them back to the um, to the panelists so that they can hear and then answer accordingly. So uh, the webinar itself is being recorded and will be available to members shortly afterwards. Uh, but if you do want more information on this, you know, feel free to contact me again. My name is Mike Wendy, like the girl's name, uh, mwendy at wispa.org. So we're going to jump right in. 
Uh, I'm going to change the screen over to uh, Doug. So just give me a second here. He's going to go first. And here we go. I'm giving you the screen, Doug. So feel free to grab it. Excellent. Thank and you, Doug, go ahead. Awesome. Well, thanks for the opportunity and thanks for everyone uh, attending today. Um, I have been in technology marketing for longer than I care to admit and been in broadband marketing uh, since around 2008. Um, one of the things that I've noticed uh, in not only technology but broadband marketing is that is that um, I'm going to use the royal we. We tend to uh, ignore some of the basics of, of marketing 101. And, um, and today I really just sort of want to revisit that and talk a little bit about about what that is to re, to remind us all and and show you uh, some things that uh, we've we've helped organizations with as far as um, marketing and broadband. So when we think about um, how we're marketing broadband today, um, 99 out of 100 times people are marketing businesses are marketing features. We're marketing speed and cost and 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 what speed costs what, uh, maybe reliability, but mostly speed and cost versus um what are the what um you know what is a benefit uh what are the benefits as far as what are the different what is what is faster broadband deliver um how's it going to change my life we we don't talk at all about about the benefits we talk about cost and, and speed so in other words we're we're trying to sell um a, a device <laughs> our little ipod here for uh if if you think about it when it was rolled out for a thousand songs in your pocket Instead of saying a thousand songs in your pocket, we're saying uh, you can store one gigabit of MP3s <clears throat> within within the iPod, which quite frankly means very little to a lot of people. So experience shows us that broadband is a, a technology. It's not a utility. It's, it's seen as a technology. It's a technology decision as far as what, what speed levels um, someone's going to buy. It's not understood um, really in terms of what is 10, 10 meg uh, versus 10 gig. Um, for for uh, a majority of, of your audience, they have no idea. Um, it does, of course, require aspirational speeds for innovation for businesses versus the speeds needed for daily use. Um, it, it requires aspirational speeds for gaming and 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 if you have three teenagers in your room or in your home. Um, but uh, really, um, our, full, our uh, markets don't really understand that. So most consumers just don't understand about the features. And quite frankly, most consumers buy benefits, not features. And I want to revisit that specific tactic. Think about um, whenever there's new technology come out, let's say a new iPhone and there's there are people in line at the Apple store um, back in the day they would spend the night so who are these people um, really these are these are uh, what what uh, Jeffrey Moore calls <clears throat> excuse me the innovators or early adopters and, and Jeffrey Moore back in the 90s wrote a book, book called crossing the chasm and really the issue is is your left side here on this slide these are people who will buy features they will buy something because it's shiny, it's new, it's faster, it's better. It just it just makes me feel like I, um, you know, I, I'm ahead of the curve as far as my neighbors or, or uh, my friends. Um, but to really gain traction in the marketplace uh, with a new technology or an improved technology, you have to get people to cross that chasm. You have to get you have to get the early majority to, into the late majority, into the laggards. So how do we do that? You have to talk about benefits because these are folks who do not buy something shiny, uh, fast, just new technology. They're buying the benefits that your technology is gonna deliver. And like I said, we are marketing a feature, mostly speed, sometimes price, not benefits. One of the reasons we're doing this is, is we, we fall into the broadband as a utility um, just like water, just like just like electricity, broadband is a utility. So it should be it should be uh, assumed that everyone's going to buy it. Everyone's going to hopefully buy buy uh, the fastest, uh, most profitable levels of service that we offer. But that's not necessarily true, because while we're we're uh, packaging these wonderful um, prices and speeds, uh, consumers are asking what what speed they need to 
watch something on Netflix without Netflix without the little uh, buffering, the the circle circle of death. Can um, how do I can I see my local um, can I see local sports? Can I see the NFL? Um, how do what speed do I need for in home teleconferences? If I'm going to be asked to work from home and uh, and be on the video, um, you know, education, all these all these benefits that that broadband should bring us um, are not are not ever really uh, front and center for how we're marketing broadband. So ultimately, just like in any technology decision, and again, uh, this is not whether I need water or not so I can bathe, this is a technology decision. You have to um, tell your consumers, tell your market what's in it for them and why they need 10, 10 meg versus one meg or 50 meg, 50 meg versus uh, one meg again. So let's think about this from from the basic, both the households and the businesses, and it's it's a much more compelling message. Uh, it's it's um, you know we have these tar target markets, and we have the demand drivers of Netflix or gaming, or over on the business side, maybe cloud applications and backups. But what's really the the appealing message? The enhanced lifestyle for for households, or the business growth and operational efficiencies that that better broadband can deliver. Uh, meanwhile, um, we, we're stuck in the speed world. So I wanna, I wanna talk to you a little bit about some, some um, instances where people have um, marketed benefits um, and some where they haven't. So I'm gonna show you, first of all, I'm gonna, I'm gonna focus on um, a client of Thinks that offers fiber to the home. Um, it's, uh, it's, in, it's called Fairlawn Gig, it's in Fairlawn, Ohio, which is right by Akron. Uh, it's not the the important part is not that there's fiber to the home. Uh, it doesn't really matter um, whether we're marketing 10 meg or 10 gig. The key point um, that I'm trying to illustrate here is that Fairlawn is showing um, showing both residences and businesses the opportunities um, and the enhanced lifestyle that that better better broadband does. In fact, um, on the on the residential side, uh, they're able to show and demonstrate that. Since Fairlawn Gig was was launched, uh, homes have uh, home values have spiked almost nine percent. I mean, you can see all the benefits of the, on the right side of my slide here about about everything that I can do with better broadband. And on the left side, we're talking about the benefits um, to the community. Um, this is a this is a real key for Fairlawn to to really get uh, the community behind this effort. As um, this was a, a significant investment for this this relatively small city. So within Fairlawn, we when we market to the residential sector, we talk about we talk about things like uh, gaming, and we talk about everything that, that they can do with um, media and, and cloud opportunities and streaming. We're not shying away from streaming; we're embracing it. We're giving we're saying that this is a great way to stream use use this the broadband, better broadband to stream these services. We're talking about the solutions um, for to make your home a smart home. Um, and, and how you do this. So a lot of, we're leading with the applications, we're leading with the benefits. Now, when we talk to businesses, we're talking about, about um, pretty, pretty sophisticated business solutions. We're talking about um, backups and, cloud and operational efficiencies and things like that. But even to bring it uh, home more, we are taking companies and organizations within the, the footprint that are using the broadband and we're telling the stories about how they're expanding markets how they're growing their business how one how one video production business moved to the to the community and brought those tax dollars with them to to the community so we're really trying to inspire um expire inspire um not only use of the network but but to sign up for the network so I'm gonna, I want to revisit. I want to visit a few other communities because I don't want to just zero in on the on the one that we've been working with for the past year or so. Um, Chattanooga um, is a pretty famous municipal network that that um, I think in this slide here I'm showing you both the good and the bad of of marketing broadband. Um, up here the, in the first one, your gig is here. Um, I'm not sure what that means. I'm not sure anybody knows what that means. So, so, so what? They're they're leading with a feature. Down here at the bot, ironically, um, it, it, this was a separate piece. They're they're um, they're talking about um, stories that explain the benefits for businesses. They're they are actually leading with 
with, with features or benefits, I'm sorry. Another community in Georgia, um, they do case studies on a regular basis within their ads, um, online and in print, that talk about businesses and residences and how it's changing their lives and what they're using the broadband for and why, um, why a entity or an individual should, should hop on uh, Optilink in this case in Georgia. Longmont, Colorado um, has taken a little bit different ta tack. Um, they are a community network, and if you uh, basically uh, YouTube uh, Nextlight uh, Longmont's broadband, um, you'll see about a, a minute and a half, I'm not gonna show it here, a minute and a half video where, where really what they're doing is they are taking, taking the civic pride, they're taking the fact that, that we do things differently in Longmont, Colorado. This is what the video says. Um, you know, have a, a box of uh, tissues next to you while, while you watch the video. Um, it's, it's just really just pulling on the heartstrings and the benefits that, that community broadband is bringing to the area. So it's, it's a nice, it's a different tack. It's not, not for everyone, but it's really civic pride. And finally, again, up the road here in Colorado, uh, a little bit east, uh, Fort Collins is rolling out its, its um, new broadband uh, network. And um, their, <laughs> their, their top option is something called the 10 gig home connection connection, which again, this is a feature, no one understands it. Um, on the one hand, um, uh, no equipment today that you can basically buy supports the 10 gig, <laughs> but on the other hand, no one understands it. So, so really, I, this is kind of my last slide to show, point out the absurd. Um, this is like saying uh, you can get 4K, 4K um, television without with leaving out the fact that someone can buy needs to buy a, a 4K television before they can see this. Um, really. Let's not go down the Connexion 10 gig path. Let's focus on the features, tell the stories of the benefits that broadband is going to bring because there is a real story between one, not, not just one meg uh, and uh, 10 meg, uh, but what you're providing um, today versus what the competition may be providing, whatever that, even if that competition happens to be you. And I'm sure that you want to expand and upgrade and, and get folks on, on a more robust connection. So if, if you can either contact Mike or you can contact me directly, if you have any questions and I'm sticking around to answer questions, um, I am gonna hand it, out to, hand it off, excuse me, to Evan, uh, who's gonna talk a little bit more about marketing as well as sales. Okay, I just gave the screen to Evan, so go ahead, Evan. Thanks, Doug. Thanks, Mike, appreciate that. Good, awesome. So yeah, thanks to everyone who took the time to join our webinar today. Really appreciate it. Uh, my name is Evan Galvin. I own a WIST called XL Broadband. We're in the rural and suburban areas just outside of Chicago. And I also started a lead generation marketing agency solely focused on the WISP industry. It's called Ping Marketing. And we've developed a platform and have been able to replicate the results from marketing the, from the marketing efforts from my WISP with other WISPs in multiple markets and help them get more customers. So um, it's it's actually funny to think about, but Ping is growing faster than my WISP now, and both companies are growing very fast. Um, in case some of you guys are wondering, why would a guy who runs a successful WISP start a marketing company? You know, did I, did I wanna make my life more complicated? <laughs> the answer is no, but um, it's, the, the thing is I got married five years ago, and I knew I needed to grow my business in order to support my new family. So I invested a ton of time and money into figuring out how to grow my business. And it really came down to sales and marketing is what I saw a lot of the, the WIS who were really moving the needle um, and, and adding a lot of customers. They were doing a lot of sales and marketing. And that's something that I really didn't have much experience on. So I started seeking out mentors and visiting other WISPs and reading as many marketing books as I could, I could and going to conferences and just trying to learn as much as I could. And I started trying to find and put a team together um, of marketing experts who can help us, help me market XL Broadband. And I realized that nobody understood the nuances of line of sight and just what a WISP is and explaining what a WISP does. And uh, having someone write copy for me was you know, a nightmare. So we just decided to insource everything and, and uh, build our own internal team. And it's resulted in quadrupling the size of my WISP in the last five years. 
Um, we've also recently been approached by Facebook, who's recognized us as the experts for WISP marketing, and we're working closely with them, testing some of the new tools they're developing specifically for WISP, and also some new strategies on how they can make the ads manager better for WISP, and so we can help WISP get more customers, which helps Facebook get more users online in rural America as well. So that's that's been pretty cool. Um, and today I want to share some, I'm going to talk a little bit about marketing, but most of it's going to be about sales and showing you some tips and tricks that can help you increase the number of customers for your WISP. Um, we're going to talk about things like funnel development, BANT, the 80-20 rule, energy and tonality, sales process, and the importance of the follow-up. So I want this to be a conversation, so um, if you guys have any questions, feel free to ask those in the Q&A section. So we'll get started here. So in order to really start scaling your company, you're gonna to wanna to make sure you have the right mindset to grow your business. You're gonna to have to have the appetite to get more customers, to want more customers, not only from a marketing and sales perspective, but also from an infrastructure perspective as well. You need to be willing to execute on all three prongs, which means you need to be, you have to be willing to invest. You're gonna to need to be able to scale and expand resources. This means in order to keep up with marketing and sales, you're gonna to need to build more towers, hire more field techs, buy more vans, increase in inventory, et cetera. So let's see. Um, so I've done a lot of, we've done a lot of tradition, we've done a, almost every type of marketing I could think of for, for my WISP. Um, but we started off doing postcards, signs, flyers. Those really moved the needle in the early days. And uh, here's just an example of a, our brochure. We we actually had this set up for EDDM, so we actually, can, you know, give it to someone in person or even mail it out. Um, and just like Doug says, you want to make sure you're talking about the benefits, not just the features. So you might not be able to read this, but it says super speeds for super surfing, watching HD movies without buffering, playing games without lag, your downloads like never before, customer service done right, and a local business who cares about you. That was, you know, that was my conversion of taking the features to benefits. I actually went to a grocery store when I was uh, first testing out these phrases, you know, about five years ago and had a spiral and I'm like, hey, what do you think of this phrase versus this? Super speed versus super surfing versus this. And I make a little tally on what people said that they liked better and that's what we rolled out with into marketing. So that's an example of the brochures. Um, here's some postcards that we've done. We did a like a pain point on the front and then on the back side it was a solution which led them to want to to uh, hit the call to action, which would be to give us a call. So um, since then, we've moved more towards social media marketing. And um, so the reason we, we've moved more to social media marketing is it's more targeted. We're, we're able to speak on the medium that our audience is on most. Um, they're not seeing advertisements in the phone book because they're not picking up phone books anymore people have their phone in their hand you know they're on Facebook they're on Instagram and it's our job as marketers to meet them where they are and right now Facebook has some very easy tools I mean you could just simply boost a post and and uh, set your radius around an address and really reach a lot of people pretty easily so that's what I would recommend is um, you know just start looking into that you can go on YouTube and learn some things about how to you know boosting a post is probably the easiest way um, might not be the least expensive technique on Facebook, but it's definitely the easiest way to get your message across to a lot of people in your area. Um, here's some examples of just some of our, our Facebook guys that we started with um, years ago. All right, so let's talk a little bit about funnel development. So on here, um, you want to develop your funnel. So some funnels have different different number of stages, but you can really design it however you want. There's there's no wrong answer. It's really just whatever works best for your company. But you're gonna want to first, you know, identify all the different lead sources that you have, whether it's, you know, website leads, postcard leads, um, Facebook leads, things like that. And you can, there's different ways to identify them by using, you know, different phone numbers and things like that where you can do tracking. Um, then you wanna develop the stages that the leads are in. There's also a scoring. I'm not sure if you guys have heard of lead scoring, but it's basically a way to help you qualify the lead a little bit further. So 
if uh, if you called the lead back and they answered, then that might be a point. If they if it's a business lead and they showed up to a meeting, then that's another point. If they were supposed to be at a meeting or were supposed to give you a call back and didn't, you could take off another point. So there's different ways where you can um, more heavily or lightly weigh a lead. So that way you have more insight on who are the most qualified leads in your funnel at any given time. Also, you could set up actions for those leads based on their score, based on which stage they're in, based on which source they're in. And um, you can really design your entire funnel so it, it behaves in the exact way that you want. And and it's a uh, it's an it's an ongoing um, evolution too. So as you learn learn better ways to do things, you can always you know adapt it. And it's really just important to know what's your goal and how can you set up your funnel to help achieve your goals. So here's a little bit um, another methodology. It's a sales methodology from IBM. It's called Bant. It helps you qualify your leads. You can use this for residential, for business leads. We use it for both types over at Excel Broadband and helps you determine their value. So um, BAN stands for budget, authority, need, and timing, or timeline, some other people could say. And we say that if if they meet three or four, three out of four of these requirements, then they're a sales qualified lead. And there's a difference between a marketing qualified lead and a sales qualified lead. Sales qualified lead is they're actually You've met, they've met three out of four of these requirements, and that's when you should really keep pursuing them. If they haven't hit three out of four of these, you need to, they need to get more marketing, you need to send them more, they need to be, they need to be warmed up more, or just the time is not right. So um, sometimes there's nothing you can do that will, will force someone to go into a later stage of the, um, of the categorization here to be qualified. So let's talk about budget. Um, the goal is to get the answers to these questions without necessarily asking them. So you don't want to say, "Hey, what's your budget?" Um, you can you can ask questions like, "So what are you guys using it for most?" And if they say that they're going to be streaming on 4K TVs in every room, then you know when you compare that to someone who says they're just using it for checking their email only with one computer and one phone, then obviously the the family that has 4K TVs in every room probably has a larger budget and there's there's other ways to to uh, help discover the budget component <clears throat> so let's talk a little bit about authority here so identifying the decision maker who has who's the authority in the business in the household that's making the decision doesn't necessarily have to be with the person on the phone right now but just at least knowing who that is um, is important that way you can you know if you're talking to the decision maker now or if you're talking to someone who can influence that decision maker and then you know if the if someone says yeah i've got to talk to my spouse you can say things like okay well when are you going to be talking to your spouse next oh well later tonight all right well let's we can set up a call where we can all hop on hop on together and we can get any questions answered and things like that. Now, some people might not want to do that. You can always schedule it for the next day, but it's definitely always good to try to get in front of who is that decision maker early on, you know, or if you can't do it early on at some point, otherwise it's going to make it a lot harder to get the sale. Also, you want to evaluate what the, what the customer's needs are. This is also known as the discovery mode. Um, you want to find out, are they using it for work? Do they do they want more speed? Um, determining determining what they need and why. Are they looking for more reliable service, better customer support? What is it that's causing them to fill out a form or give you a call and and reach out to you? So you can use all this information later on during you know conversation during the same conversation or even follow up conversations as well. And then there's the timeline. You want to determine how quickly they want service and how quickly you can provide it. Do they want service right now? Are they going to be, did they just buy a house they're going to be moving into in a month? What does that timeline look like? Um, you know, it's it's definitely really important to have, to factor all of these things in so you can really make sure that you're uh, talking to the most qualified leads that there are in your pipeline. All right, let's talk a little bit about the 80-20 rule. So 80% of the results are going to come from 20% of your actions. And just so you know, not every follow-up is going to result in a sale. Um, you want to catch up. You want to catch people when they're in their emotional buy state. 
And if you want more sales, you just got to follow up more. And just like baseball, even the greatest hitters of all time fail most of the time. So failing 70 to 80% of the time is still considered successful. The amount of effort that you put in is going to directly relate to your outcome. So don't get discouraged. It's the nature of the beast. And it's just, it's really just a numbers game when it comes down to sales. As far as time management goes, um, you want to just really make sure you're dedicating enough time to to really follow up and to really make the calls and take the calls and to give the people you're talking to the proper time that they need. Um, it's it's easy to get caught up in a lot of other things, but just trying to focus and, and really make sure you have the right amount of time um, so you can focus on the 20% that are going to move the needle 80% and get you 80% of the results. Also, getting to the no faster is a good thing. Some, sometimes there will be people who just want to you know, just want to talk and they have no intention of ever buying. So of ever buying. So just realizing who those people are um, early on can be good. <clears throat> okay. So as far as prioritizing your leads, you want to make sure that um, you want to be focusing on the warmest leads first and following up with them right away. And these are the ones that are in your pipeline that just came in your pipeline. Um, you want to be, like, as soon as a lead comes in, you want to be responding in less than five minutes. So, and we'll go over a little bit more on why that is a little bit later here, but also hang on, to, or, uh, you want to make sure you focus on the low hanging fruit. And, you know, if you, these would be the low hanging fruit. Some examples would be leads that are in your coverage area versus leads that are outside of your coverage area. If you have a method of tagging those leads with those, with those tags, um, I would highly recommend that. You know, we use ISA for in-service area and OSA for out-of-service area leads. That way, um, we're focusing on the ones that are within a certain radius of our towers. So we're not wasting salespeople's time and everything like that by talking to leads that are not even serviceable. Um, also, focusing on the leads that have expressed interest previously, the ones that have a clear line of sight, this is what we call the low-hanging fruit. Um, if there's leads that are in the middle of a forest, maybe don't focus on those ones versus the people that have clear line of sight. Also setting realistic expectations is really important for you, it's for your team. Um, while you may take all the necessary steps to prioritize your leads, it's still important to have realistic expectations for you and, and the team. So even if you take all the necessary steps to prepare, you're still going to fail 70 to 80% of the time. Make sure your team knows this, make sure you understand it and embrace it. It's definitely going to be good for morale um, because, you know, if, if, you, if you can't, if you don't like hearing no a lot, then sales probably isn't a position for you, but it makes it all the better when you hear that yes and where, when people sign up, it's, it's awesome. All right. So I would also recommend seeking out mentorships. Um, finding other WIS that are playing the game at a higher level or even other businesses in your area. But I would, I would recommend sticking with WIS that you, that you know are really moving the needle, that are, that are crushing it, that are signing up a lot of different customers or that are a lot, doing a lot of um, installations every month and talking to them, asking them, hey, what are you guys doing? What's your marketing look like? What's your sales process look like? Who's, who's taking the calls? Who's doing the follow-up calls? And really just dive in and see what are they doing differently? And if you can even learn one golden nugget from that conversation and implement it, then I consider that a win. So don't be don't be ashamed, by the way. It's okay to know if you're not the biggest cat in the jungle. Um, I mean, this is something that I'd highly recommend doing and just reaching out and talking to other WISPs. We've got the WISPA show coming up. Um, definitely a great opportunity to just go walk up to groups of people, even if you don't know them, just walk up. Um, usually a group's gonna let you in and then just listen, maybe see if you can add anything to the conversation or ask a question. And uh, yeah, I mean, start building your network of other WISPs. Having good energy and tonality is really important for salespeople. Um, people can hear when you're smiling. You know, I know it sounds kind of funny, but you just wanna make sure you're smiling and dialing. Sit up straight, sound confident. You wanna match their tone also. Uh, if someone's, you know, really low energy, like, oh yeah, yeah, I want internet. You don't want to be like, hey, I've got the best internet. You know, you don't want to be having that much of a dramatic variance. Um, you want to 
meet them where they are, okay? So um, also be aware of your pace. Uh, I would practice with some of your coworkers, ask them for feedback. I mean, don't be embarrassed. It's it's actually pretty fun. I mean, and getting feedback from the people you work with is, is good. And uh, I would I would also recommend if you can record your calls, make sure it's it's legal where you are. Um, but and but I would definitely recommend recording your calls, listening to those, um, writing a pitch, practicing it. Also familiar familiarize yourself with the most common objections. And um, when you listen to your recordings, you'll actually be able to you know maybe take some notes and on things of how you can improve it and make it better. So. Active listening is really important as well. Um, you want to concentrate on your lead as if you're in the room there with them, even if you're just on the phone, just imagine that they're sitting there right with you in the room, that they're the only person in the room and you have no distractions. And repeat, you know, as far as making sure that they know you understand them, make sure you repeat whatever information that they're telling you back to them so they know you understand, so you know you understand. And it's also important to respond and not leave awkward silences. It's your job as a salesperson to control the conversation. Acknowledgement phrases like, yeah, mm-hmm, I agree, exactly, etc. Those are all phrases you can use to let the other party know that you're that you're listening and paying attention. Taking good notes is huge. I'd highly recommend adding your notes to the whichever C, you know CRM you're using. So that way when you talk to them again in the future, you can pull up your notes and it'll you've you've just painted the picture to yourself in the future, which is awesome. Because remembering all the notes and little things for every every lead that comes through is going to be almost impossible. So these notes can be used later on. Um, you can you could say things uh, later on in that conversation. They could be used later on for the follow up as well. You could say things like, "Hey, uh, you said you want to watch 4K TVs in all your rooms at the same time, but you don't, you know. But here's your budget, you know." And then they could they could be like, "Oh yeah, okay, that doesn't make sense. I probably should spend a little bit more if that's what I'm trying to do." Um, good notes will also help make you more relevant. It'll let them know you're paying attention and that you actually care. Because I mean, it's I know at least with a lot of the WISTs that I've talked to, we all really do care about our customers. We want them to know that, hey, we're not these giant corporations that like uh, the big name corporations that most consumers hate. We're a local business. We care about you guys. You're in our community. So taking good notes and being able to recall that information later on is really important to let them know um, that you care and it'll help build a lot of rapport. So then you can also um, identifying their pain points is really important as well. Asking good questions, the right questions. That way you can understand a little bit more about why did they call today? Um, were they referred by someone? Did they see an ad? Where, where did you hear about us? Um, and other things like why, so what made you give us a call today? Yeah, I'm paying for something that's just not working. The speeds are really slow or the customer support is horrible with the company that I'm at now. Um, also, you could say, you know, if they if they say, yeah, I've got satellite internet, um, knowing your competition is really good because you can instantly know that there's high latency with satellite. Every time there's a cloud in the sky, it's going to cut out. And all of these things can be used as leverage later on when you're when you're pitching them on your solution. Which brings me to my next point. I would recommend creating a pitch. Um, write down your pitch study it memorize it you want to test it learn it improve it and some of the ways you can create a pitch would be just asking yourself some questions of um, why would somebody sign up for for my wisp and then write those reasons down and then come up with you know a way to structure those so where it flows in sentences so where you're able to um, so we're able to create a pitch that includes a lot of your benefits in those sentences and it answers all their questions up front. So if you say things like, yeah, we've got, you know, over 200 five star reviews on Google and Facebook. We offer speeds up to 25, up to 100 megs in the area um, and things like that, including your benefits in your pitch helps answer all the questions that they might be wondering. And then you can save the time for other, other uh, questions that they might have. So 
yeah, definitely, definitely a good idea to load your pitch with benefits. Also, there's closes too that you can use. Um, there's so many different videos and articles on closes. These are phrases you could say when someone says, oh, I've got to think about it, or I've got to talk to my wife. Um, some cases they really do have to think about it or talk to their spouse, but most of the time these are not objections. These are just stalls because they don't really know what to do. It's your job as a salesperson to take control of the conversation and be leading them to the close, okay? So um, yeah, that's that's really, there's a whole lot we can go into on closes, but I'll just leave it there. I'd highly recommend going on YouTube and just Googling closes. There's there's so much about, uh, so much to learn in this, in this topic right here. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the follow-up. <clears throat> All right, so all of these things that we've talked about are extremely important, and when you're willing to do everything, things could still go wrong if you don't do a good follow-up. Um, we're gonna talk about how important this is here. Here's a couple of stats that we're able to gather across all sales industries. So we've got 48% of sales reps never even follow up with the lead. I know you might not be thinking this is happening at your company, but it definitely is. Reps might tell you the lead isn't interested, but it's probably just your sales rep not following up with enough. Of that though, 25% of reps give up after the second contact. They might be like, yeah, I called and left the voicemail, but the leads aren't calling me back, you know, and then people just kind of get lost in the pipeline. So lead nurturing is extremely important because the truth of the matter is 80% of the sales happen between the fifth and 12th contact. Sometimes it's gonna take two weeks. Sometimes it might take four or five months. It really just depends on your exact target market, the product you're selling, et cetera, but 80% of the sales happen between the fifth and 12th contact. Sales, sales people are gonna give you some pushback. They're gonna be like, oh, they don't wanna to talk to me. I don't wanna piss people off. Well, just like the Wolf of Wall Street says, don't hang up that phone until they buy or freaking die. Keep calling them until you make the sales guys. Another thing that's really important is the speed to that follow-up. A lot of sales reps are gonna be in the middle of something, maybe taking a coffee break, updating the CRM, but once a lead comes in, if you're not on that lead immediately, they've shifted gears, man. The consumer has gotten so much smarter, their attention span is so much shorter, and we need to get in contact with them right away. You can see the drop off from, from one to two minutes right here. Imagine if you guys are waiting 30 minutes or an hour, there's so much money you guys are leaving on the table by not calling these people back immediately when, that, when they're in that emotional buy stage. So, We've accepted the truth that all sales reps across all industries face challenges with following the perfect sales plan 100% of the time. People are human, we totally get that. We even saw it in ourselves. So we, what we decided to do was build a completely automated follow-up system for our leads that truly helps us turn these leads we generate into cash by automating every single step from the phone calls, text messages, pre-recorded voicemails, emails, CRM reminders, all the way through the funnel. Um, on the, so there's, there's so many different pieces of software you can use for automations, which I'd highly recommend. Um, we've, we've implemented some automations and on the first day that we've implemented them, we are able to send out 196 personalized text messages. This had the people's name in it, the city that they filled the lead information in and everything. Um, we left 98 custom voicemails This is with one sales rep in one day and sent out 196 personalized emails and he made 294 calls. So it was, uh, <laughs> he was exhausted after the first day. I probably wouldn't recommend doing that many on the first day with automations, but we just wanted to see what could be done and it was pretty cool. So if you guys wanna close more deals, these are the things that you guys, these are some of the techniques that you guys can, can implement. So, um, all right, next is asking questions that you, get a little bit of feedback here, hang on a sec. Um, I think somebody's microphone might be on because I'm hearing a little feedback. But okay, so you wanna ask questions that are gonna have a purpose, right? That are gonna help you come back to your value, value proposition. So all the things that we talked about before, you know, finding out their pain points, bands, you know, the budget, authority, needs, timeline, all of that, Will bring you to asking the right questions. So um, you can say things like, "Hey, are you, so you're paying $69 a month and you're only getting two megs, 
two mags of service. How does that work for you? Kind of make them make them feel the pain a little bit more, agitate that, and then be like, hey, we can give you, you know, 25 mags for a little bit less. Um, also, identifying the common objections. So, what are what are the most common objections? I'd, I highly recommend sit down with your sales team um, or whoever is in charge of, you know, taking calls. Um, whether and I would recommend getting the marketing department involved as well, or even the whole company. I mean, you can. This could be a whole company, depending on how big your company is. This could be worth having, you know, most most people in there because the installers even have good insight on these things too. Same with customer support. But figuring out what are the most common objections of why people are saying no, I'm not interested. Is it because they're that you're too expensive? Is it that the speeds are too slow? What is it? And then you can from there create responses to to those objections and you can role play these with your coworkers um, it's i would say this is very helpful in in helping overcome some of the some of those objections that way when you're on a call with the with the lead you can instantly recall your responses and definitely help move them to the close and the last thing i want to talk about is celebrating your wins whether you get a bell or a buzzer every time you guys get a sale you know <laughs> ring the bell hit the gong whatever it is maybe a snippet of a song plays um we we have a slack channel dedicated to the sales team so anytime a sales made everybody not everybody but a lot of people go in there and you know post little emojis or say hey nice job and kind of congratulate each other so it really just helps make everything everything uh you know worth it so that's that's what I wanted to talk to you guys about as far as marketing and sales. So hopefully you guys got a little bit of, out of that and pass it back over to Mike here. Thanks. Thanks, Evan. And now I'm going to grab back the screen real quick. Um, I have a couple questions here. I hope everyone uh, got a lot of it, a lot of good information there. I have one question uh, from um, a attendee and either one of you can answer this, um, Doug or Evan. What platforms for advertising or marketing do you find to be the most effective? So, sure, whoever sure. wants to jump in there. Um, I think that there's there's two distinct. I will say that if you if you want, um, let's let's start start with the harder harder and probably more profitable segment businesses. Um, as much as we'd like to think that. People are sophisticated and on social media they're they're much less less on social media and and, and really what we've what I found really makes a difference is tell is is sharing stories through through um, <clears throat> e-newsletters uh, and e email blasts um, whereas your residential sector um, I think Evan who I think was smiling when he was talking. <laughs> um, at least that's what he says we should all do. Uh, was social media? I think Evan, you want to talk talk about social media on the residential side and how how it's working for you? Yeah, yeah. I would say I would say that the best platform for sure would be Facebook, and Facebook includes Instagram and their web audience as well, which goes out to you know thousands of different sites. But yeah, I mean. In order to get the lowest cost per lead, Facebook Facebook's audience is going to be the best for sure. Um, you can. There's a whole lot that goes into that. There's courses on Udemy. There's Facebook's um, blueprint. You can learn how to do it. But yeah, definitely Facebook and Instagram would be the lowest cost per lead as far as that platform. There's a lot you could do with Facebook groups too. Um, there's just so much you could do. Uh, I would say also. Uh, Google, Google's network is definitely really good. You're going to pay a little bit more per, well, not a little bit, you're going to pay more per lead. But mm -hmm. I mean, if you've, I would, I would recommend if you had one thing to pick, I would definitely pick Facebook. That's for sure. Um, if you had a large budget, I would say, if you had a very large budget, I would say do Facebook, Instagram, Google, postcards, um, probably look into Nextdoor also, um, AdWords for sure for residential. Those are, those are and if you're over on the business side, I don't know. I've I've had limited success with LinkedIn ads. I don't know if I don't know where you, where you are, Evan, as far as whether you've you, you've dabbled in the LinkedIn ad world. Yeah, we right now we we have not. We're we're currently pursuing some success with B two B marketing for our WIS, but um, 
we still have not cracked that code yet. It's definitely, uh, it's definitely a yeah, I, little bit tougher. But I think the business is you think about who the decision makers are. They're they're older. They're they're um, probably not not the best best area to get them on social media. You still still old old school marketing tell tell stories and and, and really mm -hmm. hope that yeah. hope that folks connect the dots. Yeah, and if you could find the the IT directors or whoever's in charge of that, that that business and do a connection request, that'll definitely help at least get you in front of who might be the decision maker. We've had some success with that, but um, we're looking to we're looking to step that up and combine it with ads as well soon too. All right, uh, I have another question from uh, an attendee. Uh, is there any difference between uh, the way you compete or market uh, to a customer that has a competitor already in the market versus one that does not and sort of is a complete newbie or has a lack of choice. Is there, are, are there differences? Are there different approaches to that? You want to take it first, Evan? Yeah, I, I would say um, we did. So in the rural areas, it's I'm not sure if it's easier because, I mean, we've got eight or nine other WISP right in, in our coverage area. So that's our competition. So we're, um, so we've got our marketing for that, but then we've also are heading into the suburbs in some areas where we're going head to head with AT&T and Comcast. And we definitely changed the marketing up a little bit for that. We offer higher speeds um, to make it so it's a little bit more competitive. Uh, it's, and we focus on that we're local, you know, keeping the money in the community. We're our customer support, you know, is more personalized and things like that. So we do, we do change it up a little bit um, based on based on the other providers in the area. Yeah. Yeah, I think that I think that really what you have to do um, is you have to find what your story is. What what's the positive? Um, and I don't know if this was the the one question that I'm seeing in the chat, Mike. But you really have to remain positive, and you have to tell the story whether you're you're you are first out of the box or, or whether whether you're trying to compete with others you have to find what your differentiator like like Longmont is is um, we love our our community here in Colorado um, you know to tell your tell stories about about you know everything from how um, grandparents are having their having grandkids say say they want to go over to uh, grandma and grandpa's house for for internet you re really just remain positive really tell your story be it be it um, from from a uh, better better service perspective, from from a uh, solutions that are now enabled because of, of again the enabler, which is the speed. So really, just remain positive and tell tell those those good stories. But sometimes, quite frankly, it, it takes um, organizations uh, just sitting down with somebody and and talking through their business to sort of pull out what the competitive advantages are because. Um, I find, at least with some of the people that I talk to, um, and that's why sometimes I, I not only talk to businesses, I talk to their clients. Sometimes people are a little too humble, and a, and maybe that's human nature. Um, I've I've found in this space, it's even more human nature than than normal. Um, just find find your competitive advantage and really lead with that, and the and and turn that into a benefit. Yeah, I'll, I'll echo that, Doug. I mean, I I agree that if t sharing your stories of how like what you what you reminded me of is a time where we had that area where we we're going to um, head to head with the cable company and we went out and got we had some customers in that area already so we went out um, hired a, a local cameraman and basically started just filming video testimonials of how it's changed their life or how it's better right. than the competition without actually like saying anything bad about the competition because no. you never want to do that but yeah i mean if you can get actual stories of how this internet is so much better than anything they've had before, I mean, that's gold right there because it's a lot better to hear something like that from a third party than it is from your own company. And so. even if it's not, let's say, get getting back down to the speed, let's say that your speed and prices are exactly, I doubt they are, but let's say they're exactly the same. Those mm -hmm. testimonials might be about, you know, the team the team from company, you know, Wispa X came out, came out and really helped me understand everything I could do online, really really provided one-on-one -on -one service. You know, you really need to um, check your humility at the door and, and tell some great stories about, about, about yeah. yourselves. Yeah, I, you know, I just like to add, I think that we underrate our, that, that local aspect, and that's a very yes. important thing that we have. 
that others don't. You know, this isn't a call center. It's not a corporation based in, you know, New York or Los Angeles or overseas. I'm I'm going I'm sending my kids to school with your kids. And, yeah. we, you know, this is a community thing. We have uh, time for one more question. And uh, this is basically look. A lot of WISPs are small companies, and so what are steps that you know to to kind of squeeze as much as you can out of the limited staff and resources? I mean, how does someone with say three or five workers, employees, uh, implement some of these steps and and some of this advice? Is there are, are there any things to focus on first? Uh, I'm going to take this first real quick. Yeah. I, I think that the the most important thing to focus on um, as, is your message, is what makes you different and special and however you're going to present that message in a Facebook ad or a testimonial video or whatever. I think, I think one of the things that, that um, and one of the reasons why I'm in this space is, is someone looked at me 15 years ago and he was a brilliant CTO type person and he said feature benefit they're the same thing and a lot of times in technology, we just focus on making things work and really, really, um, whether it's faster or better or, or more rock solid. Um, you, I think that the key, no matter what you do, is to get that message right about what makes you different and special. And, and like you say, Mike, everybody's local. You know, even if you want to pull on people's heartstrings to keep the dollars within the community, uh, maybe it's, maybe it's even, um, maybe it's, it's even as, as, as simple as that, but I, I think it's, you want to get your message down right. Uh, Evan, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, having having a clear message is, is really good. And, and I know that, um, you know, if you guys can create a story that's relatable to everybody else, I mean, I've, I put one on our website under the About Us section for XL Broadband. And it's funny because I, you know, I when I meet customers like, oh yeah, I just love your story about, you know, and it's, it's cool. So I, people do read some of that. There's not everybody's going to read it, but if you have a good story, people, um, people can definitely relate to that and appreciate it. Um, I would say, you, yeah, I'm sorry, real quick. I just want to interrogate. But if you know, if you don't know what makes you different from the rest of the, from your competition, then you're not going to be able to craft the Facebook ad or the, or the anything. So mm -hmm. go ahead, go ahead. That's what, that's what yeah. I mean. And, and actually, it's sometimes it's hard it's hard to write your own story because yes. you know when you're when you're the when you're that person it's kind of hard to see what other people might see so um, definitely working with your team and trying to figure out you know how did you guys get, get started what how did everything start and how can you communicate that to make it relatable um, you can get a lot of ideas from from your team you know on that but I would I would recommend yeah, coming up with a good story clear messaging like Doug said um, if you have low staff, low budget. Um, I would, I would probably write, I mean, Facebook groups are free and you can go and join some of your local mm -hmm. um, garage sale groups or buy and sell groups and just go in there. And I mean, you could probably search the group for the word internet or broadband and find a bunch of old posts from people saying, Hey, what internet provider do you guys use in the area? And there's always a whole bunch of people willing to, to say who, and then you can, Go and start responding to older threads and bump them up and um just be, hey if you guys are looking for another option we're we're uh if you're new in the area or you know just if you just want to introduce yourself um as a member of the community and then put your contact info there and just or just tell people to message you um that that's been very successful for us and it's free um and a lot of one, yeah. one thing that i've seen in a lot of communities these days is, is the next door email groups i don't i don't know if you have it in your neighborhood but it's called next door yeah, uh, and uh, that's that's another great great uh, local localized solution. So. Definitely. Well, good. I, I appreciate everyone's uh, input. The presentations were fantastic. I hope that everyone got uh, a bunch of information that they can use and also use to to create more benefit for their companies, more prosperity and growth for the companies. We certainly have a lot of good tips here. Um, so thanks again to uh, Doug and Evan uh, and the attendees. Uh, if you do want any more information, 
you know, about this or really anything WISPA, please feel free to contact me. You see the information on the screen, Mike Wendy at uh, mwendy at wispa.org. And I just got to put this one plug in here at the end. Uh, we have WISPA Palooza coming up. If you haven't registered, please do. We'd love to have you. It's a great conference, lots of information. If you enjoyed this, you know, multiply it by 30 times, uh, 300 times, and, and you'll really get a lot of benefit out of WISPA Palooza. So, Again, thank you to everyone. Thank you to the speakers and attendees, and everyone have a good day. All right, thanks, thanks everybody. Much. Have a great, great day. Appreciate, appreciate it. Thanks. Thanks, guys. Bye.